There are a lot of stories about how Bogotone got her name and what it means. Um, but we know from historical research, it's actually a nautical term, meaning a rocky or a jagged inlet. A raton is actually a mouse, as if, you know, rats had been gnawing at it. I think that's the metaphor. But the punchline is the original site of Boca de Ratones was on Biscayne Bay near Miami Beach in Miami. And somehow in the 19th century, it got associated with our Lake Boca Raton. The more southerly location went away, the more northerly location stuck. And so our name is just a map maker's error. Boca Raton in the early 20th century was really home to three communities. The white community, which was located in the vicinity of Palmetto Park Road, Dixie Highway, which is where the Florida East Coast Railroad tracks are, is where the, the freight depot would be, and that would be the center of town. Japanese American community at Yamato, and yes, that's how they pronounced it, uh, west of the FEC tracks at Yamato Road, and Pearl City, which was the African American community, south of what is today Glades between Dixie and Federal Highway. Yamato and Pearl City were farming communities. Everybody grew pineapples. The, contrary to popular belief, the Japanese did not introduce the pineapple. They actually learned to grow pineapple from a Michigander who came to Boca Raton very early on. Tomato, citrus, every kind of winter vegetable. Boca remained a farming town um, until the 1920s when the Florida land boom hit. And everything changed absolutely radically. It was a time of great um, prosperity in America and the Florida land boom was like the Klondike gold rush. But the golden sands of Florida beaches uh, were like the gold of the gold rush. So into that picture comes a man named Addison Meisner. And Meisner has already established himself as the society architect in Palm Beach the most famous architect working in the Mediterranean revival style. So he's doing very well for himself, but he decides to get into real estate development, which was the favorite hobby of the day. So along with his brother Wilson and a lot of very wealthy Palm Beach backers, uh, he looks to Boca Raton uh, and purchases 1,600 acres, about three miles of oceanfront in what is today Southeast Boca for the Meisner Development Corporation, uh, and they named their project Boca Raton. His Boca Raton project is getting going just months before the land boom starts to go bust. For a variety of reasons, there was an embargo of building supplies on the Florida East Coast Railway, which at the time was still the only rail line that was completed through to Miami. And that was a principal means of transport. Wealthy people come in the winter, just like they do now, uh, in January, February, March, and it is delightful and it is wonderful. But regular people came in July and August to very seasonal towns all over our state uh, where there's no place to stay, there's no place to eat, there's no air conditioning, there's no pest control. It's awful. And they get in their cars and go back north and say, you have got to be crazy to buy land in Florida. And then, if that isn't enough, we got hit with not one, but two killer hurricanes. The 26th storm, which is they call the storm that ended the boom. And two years later, the West Palm storm came ashore, pushed all the water out of Lake Okeechobee and drowned over 3,000 people. The long-term effects were that anyone who was coming south didn't. Anybody who could get out of Dodge did. 
So the Great Depression comes years ahead of the rest of the nation. In 1927, uh, Meisner Development Corporation was bankrupt, and a man named Clarence Geist, who was a Palm Beach guy, uh, was one of the original investors. He acquires the assets of Meisner Development for $72,000. But the principal asset is the Cloister Inn. Geist was an avid golfer. He needed a golf resort for the winter time. So he hires architect Schultz and Weaver, who built the Breakers in Palm Beach and the Biltmore in Coral Gables, to triple the size of the Cloister Inn, and it opens as the Boca Raton Club in January of 30. Now the club, aside from farming, becomes the major economic engine of the community throughout the 30s. Brings many amenities to town because Mr. Geis wants his patrons to have only the best. So as a result, he builds a, a state-of-the-art water plant, a new Florida East Coast railway station, passenger station. The club is, is as I say, the um, important financial base for the community until uh, long comes the 1940s and World War II. December 7, 1941, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and U.S officially enters the war and declares war on uh, the Axis powers. The Army Air Force Technical Training Command decides to build the Boca Raton Army Airfield in Boca Raton. It was initially stationed at the hotel, the club, because that was the largest venue, uh, but they needed good flying weather uh, and they initially come to Morrisonville in Palm Beach for a few months uh, and then relocate to Boca Raton in May of 42. It occupied uh, almost 6,000 acres from Palmetto Park Road on the south to north of Yamato uh, and from the Florida East Coast tracks on the east to the CSX tracks, which is the Amtrak tracks, on the west. So a very large base. It was the Air Corps' only radar training base uh, from May of 42 forward, and radar was top secret. So any of the flight crews, navigators, mechanics, anybody dealing with any aspect of radar for the Air Force uh, were, had to be stationed at Boca as a result. Possibly as many as 50 to 100,000 men and women were stationed there between 42 and 47 in a town of 750 people. So it made a dramatic impact, um, of course a great boon to the local economy, but um, it made the citizens very proud. There were a lot of civilian employees as well. In the 60s, that's when things really heat up, a real time of change in Boca Raton history. First of all, we have Florida Atlantic University, which comes to town. It opens in 1964 uh, on former air base lands. We also have uh, real estate development really come into its own in this era, particularly a company called Arvida, which stands for its founder's name, Arthur Vining Davis, who was a very, very wealthy man who owned the, what is today, Boca Raton Resort and Club. Uh, and much of West Boca, all these former farmlands, former green bean fields. And Arvida is really the father of the gated community, which becomes very associated with Boca Raton in the next ensuing decades. Another factor from the 60s is in 67, a company called International Business Machines, IBM, comes to town to manufacture a small mainframe computer, one that was very commonly used in industry. So IBM Boca Raton plant produces many different systems and wonderful uh, technologies for the world, but it was there in 1981 that the IBM PC personal computer was constructed and distributed to the world. Pretty advanced stuff. But to IBM, it's all in a day's work. 
the IBM personal computer AT. Boca becomes the center of PC operations. It's incredibly successful for IBM. Uh, and that in turn attracts a lot of high tech industries to Boca Raton. It becomes what we call a Silicon Beach for a while. In the 1990s, IBM began downsizing its um, Boca Raton operations, which was a bit of a blow to the local economy. There still is a presence. It's, today it's IBM South Florida. However, Boca was here. The developments kept being created in western Boca Raton. Boca kept spreading further, further west. Today, Boca Raton is seen as a very desirable address. Uh, as well as a um, beautiful resort community with magnificent beaches and amenities that are a draw for people from all over the U.S.